Celia, it's great to see you. The last time we met, I think, was 2017. You were at Notre Dame. We did the conference together, The Quest for Consonants, Theology and the Natural Sciences. And I might say that's a, a good part of Closer to Truth's 18 season, which people can see on Closer to Truth YouTube channel or Closer to Truth.com. The 18 season, Quest for Consonants, Theology and the Natural Sciences, seven episodes. Now you're at Oxford. Uh, what's your position and what are your current pursuits? Okay, thank you. And it's, uh, it's a pleasure to see you again. And it's a pity it's not in person. Uh, <laughs> yes, I've been here since 2019, a full time position with the uh, with the Campion Hall. Uh, and what my, the, my task here was to establish a new research institute uh, called the Loud Art of Sea Research Institute. So I'm its inaugural director. And we spent the last two years um, getting this new institute established. And the purpose is to work at the interface between theology, ecology, and development studies, um, but also to implement some of the message within the Loud, Loud Art of Sea, which has, incidentally, the most science of any encyclical that's ever been published. So oh, okay. there are, you know, a number. So there's the interdisciplinary research in science and religion is still in there, but it's more directed towards maybe slightly different purposes than the than the, the centre that I um, directed at the University of Notre Dame. I can't imagine a person better suited for that. Uh, you have undergraduate degree in biology and a PhD in, in biology, plant physiology in specific, and then you went on to duplicate that in theology, an undergraduate degree and then a PhD in systematic theology. And you've talked about the importance of understanding systematic theology in relationship to the biological sciences, uh, targeting evolution, ecology, genetics, bioethics, uh, sustainability, um, ecotheology, uh, a, a new term. Uh, uh, how, how does those integrate? Because many of those subjects seem to do quite well without theology. Yes, well, it, it's interesting because one of the um, aspects which Pope Francis insisted on in his in Laudato Si was that theology was both essential to thinking through the differences uh, that we, the challenges that we need to face, but also perhaps um, understanding some of the roots of the problems that we're in as well. So, and his argument and the argument that we make in the Laudato Si Research Institute that is that some of the the challenges that we have need to be addressed from the spiritual as well as the secular realm. So it's not really a, a sufficient to, um, to just look at the, the secular solutions. We have a lot of knowledge, for example, about climate change, but we don't always know how to act or why there's lack of motivation to act. Mm -hmm. So um, one of the areas that I'm particularly interested in and what this book is trying to do is, is look at, you know, why people act either either well or, or, or less well, um, and what are the roots of some of those things for, for positive, proactive, or pro-social behaviour, or the, or the opposite. And there are secular anthropological or biological interpretations of what that might look like, and there are also theological ones. And I think the, the idea of bringing these together is, is for mutual illuminating, illumination purposes. <laughs> Uh, so, so I don't think theology has all the answers, but I think it does contribute to the discussion in a really creative and interesting way. What, what's an example in, in any of these uh, interrelated fields where theology can ask a question or discern or distinguish or discern between different alternatives that these uh, uh, fields of biology would not be able to do by itself? What might be an example? Well, I'm going to use the example of wisdom because it's also been a thread that weaves through all my, many of my various works. Um, and yeah. I'll give you an example of some work I did with Augustin Fuentes, but it's still informed in this book as well. When I first started talking to him, and Augustin is, has a, a background in zoology, but he's also an anthropologist and interested in evolutionary anthropology. When I first met him in Princeton in 2012-13, in terms of working closely with him, it became very clear to me that anthropology didn't really take much account of wisdom. And we originally had the idea for doing something like this some years before in Chester, but the research didn't really develop. It was only when I started talking to someone with an open mind like Augustine that he was prepared to think, well, 
maybe this is interesting from an anthropological point of view because the kinds of processes that they tried to track in terms of what was happening in the early evolutionary record weren't related to the interconnectedness between things, which is what wisdom is really all about. Yeah. Uh, and so therefore, asking it in that way raised new questions for the science that weren't there before in a really interesting way. So the Shadow Sophia, if you like, which is what this book conversation is about, is, is about the, the, the darker side, if you like, of why it is that these, this wisdom doesn't always um, develop or maybe barriers to its development, and therefore it helps us understand it a little bit better. And I think the the uh, the worst there were some articles published in in uh, current anthropology, for example, in some other sort of top journals that arose out of this collaborative research. So I'm not saying that that theology um, is directly involved in that research. It just sparks new questions for the science in a way that perhaps they hadn't thought of before. And for theologians, at least, engaging with the scientific enterprise illuminates and informs the way we think theologically, or needs to at least. And that's what I'm arguing for in this book, is that theology shouldn't try and do its work on its own. It needs the whole breadth of the, of the different sciences in order to fully understand. Um, now, one I, I also mentioned Paul Ricoeur in, in uh, and some of his philosophy in, in many of the, both the last two volumes that I've written. And Paul Ricoeur argues that, that science tries to, to talk about explanation, whereas philosophy talks about understanding. And I think that is a, a reasonable char uh, characteristic of what the two are all about. Um, but at the same time, I think that the more open-minded anthropologists at least are also interested in understanding as well. They are interested in narrative about what, what it is that made people human and what makes meaning and that kind of thing. So do it becomes you, easier to have those conversations. You use the example of shame in the uh, early anthropological record as uh, perhaps a linkage between understanding some of the ways of thinking of theology potentially um, and the uh, anthropological uh, development. Uh, how did that work? Yes, well, shame is, is interesting because many of the anthropologists don't want to talk about guilt because guilt implies that some sort of judgment, whereas shame is more about what you might call early or moral sentiment, um, which then has an effect on the way people behave. So if you're ashamed about what you do, you're not going to act in, in a similar way again. Um, and so, so, but as far as theologians are, are concerned, it's a little bit more complicated than that. There's also um, a recognized sense of, of guilt of, of having done wrong um, according to certain moral norms. Now, with over time, um, I think it is possible to track um, the relationship between morality and, and religion and what religious rules and norms might then do in terms of its relationship with, with morality. Um, but that research hasn't really been done and it's more, um, cultural evolution research. Uh, so, so what I was interested in in this book was tracking the, the research going on in, in very early human evolution. So I'm saying that there are co even closer relationships between theology and evolution, the, the more recent you, you get in terms of um, analysis, whereas this, this work was more about some what you might call the premonitions of something like guilt emerging or something like eventually, of course, religious belief that would shape those moral norms. But, you know, we're looking at the sort of the deepest possible um, time um, and therefore these very early stages of, of this tendency towards thinking about things in terms of um, shame towards what we've done in a particular community setting. Um, so there, if you like, this is way before religion was even on the cards. Um, so I wouldn't say that religious belief or practices were in place at this stage, but it's like the background to which, in which religious belief was then set in a very interesting way. So let's get into the meat of our discussion. We wanna talk about your book, your new book, uh, Shadow Sophia, which I 
must say, has been my companion for the last week, and I've thoroughly enjoyed reading it. I've, I've known of your work, but it was, this was innovative and, and dynamic and made me think in, in ways I haven't thought, which, which I love to do. So it's the second volume of a trilogy that you're doing on the evolution of wisdom. We're going to get into all of these terms. But I want to begin by asking um, a, a practical question that you pose in the book, which uh, highlights one of the critical uh, distinguishing factors. And you ask very currently about COVID-19 that you say it blurs the boundary between natural and moral evil. Why? Yes, well, I mean, I think that's a, it, it, that's a really good question. What I meant by that was that the way COVID spreads isn't just a matter of its biological basis. There are also political and social decisions, which mean that it either will escalate or not. So Sometimes we think of, of natural evil as just occurring from natural processes, but this is much more complicated than that. Um, you, you can see from the different lockdown or other scenarios in different countries, how they've dealt with it. Some countries like New Zealand, for example, have virtually no, no one um, affected. Others like Brazil, where there's a much laissez-faire attitude by the government, it's spread like wildfire and new variants are coming out. So there's, if you like, a co-evolution in terms of what humans are doing and what the virus is doing, because it's able to multiply and make all these different variants in contexts where it's allowed to spread. So it's, it's not just a simple biological process. There's also the these other cultural issues as, as well, which are how where people are being either more or less morally responsible. So that's what I meant by it being a, an evil that's both natural and and moral. It's on that kind of boundary between between the two. Why I like that is because when I went into the book, my natural predilection would be, um, I happen to be very interested in theology, but I had uh, some doubts about whether theology will have much impact on the biological sciences and how to think about these things, except in some very generic uh, sense. Uh, but when you pose that question uh, with COVID-19 as, as uh, defining a boundary, a blurring boundary between natural and moral evil, which of course are critical factors in the theology of thinking about uh, uh, morality um, and evil and the problem of evil, uh, th that actually gave a currency. So I, I think that's, uh, th that's a very positive development. So what I'd like to do is start at the beginning a little bit to give the context. And I'm gonna ask you, you know, the hardest question at first, which is a, a a, a short definition of wisdom, because this is your core, the evolution of wisdom in these three volumes. Okay, yes. I mean, in the past, I've tended to resist giving definitions yep. because wisdom itself defies definition <laughs> by definition. Okay. Um, but at the same time, I think that what's indicated by wisdom is that ability to make interconnections. That's one of its sort of, if you like, more secular aspects. But theologically, it has two dimensions. One is uh, wisdom is about our understanding or our approach to God. And so, and that's one facet of it. The other facet is much more practical and practical wisdom has all these different um, elements in it, including uh, foresight, uh, but also circumspection that is looking at the present, but also memoria that's thinking about the past. So, and it involves a, a, a deliberation a judgment and an action. And because practical wisdom or prudence does that, it means you can start thinking in evolutionary terms about the, all those different elements. The, the element towards the transcendent, that is wisdom as far we, as we understand God, which is really what theology is, is of course comes later, if you like, in the evolutionary record. But my suggestion, at least in this book, is that practical wisdom and other forms of wisdom, which are more theological, work in synchrony with one another and so therefore need to be understood together rather than separately um, and Thomas Aquinas was very informative to my thought he his understanding of both wisdom or divine wisdom and human wisdom that's orientated towards that divine wisdom and practical wisdom are extremely clear and well thought through and you know I've used that as a sort of sounding board but what is particularly interesting about wisdom is that it then influences all those other all the other virtues as well and so the our inability to think holistically and just think in terms of reason 
is not really mm -hmm. enough. So wisdom combines both reason and affect in a really helpful way. So it doesn't look at either one or the other. And there's a tendency, I think, to think that the, our nature as human beings is either purely rational or purely emotional. And that's those two main trajectories of, of moral, morality are either about our passions or about our reason, whereas wisdom combines those two and says, no, we can't just have either one or the other. It's a, an integration of both. So given that definition, how can we begin to scope out its evolution? Because that's the point of your three volumes, the evolution of wisdom. And so we're gonna get into a lot more detail, but just give me the categories that would apply to an evolutionary approach to wisdom. One, for example, that you use, what can we learn from the animal world that um, can be applied uh, to morality and, and, and wisdom? So, I mean, that's one category, but what, what are the big categories uh, for the evolution of wisdom? Yes, I, I mean, I think that um, I think the, the aspect of wisdom is that when you're looking at something like the, the evolution of, of justice or the evolution of, of love or charity or compassion, all those also interlace with wisdom. So when I'm talking, the evolution of wisdom is the broad category that I'm using works to an extent, but it's also because it's connected with all these other aspects that it's helpful to, to think through in evolutionary terms, because there is quite a strong evidential basis for compassion very early on in our human history, going back to the Neanderthals and so on. Um, justice is also uh, analyzed by those working with other primates in terms of inequity aversion. Um, wisdom is a bit more challenging to know whether you're really looking at it, but we did at least have an attempt at that at some of the work I did at Notre Dame with Augustine Fuentes. But I think that the idea is to see all these aspects as being interconnected with one another. And so that's, the, if you like, the first moment. The second moment is to look at what are the barriers to that wisdom developing in, in a positive kind of way. And that's what sh where Shadow Sophia comes in. And then the third element is, well, what difference does religion really make to our wisdom? Is it adding anything or not? And that's the third volume that I'm in the middle of writing at the moment and won't be out for a few years. So the really sort of, if you like, each volume becomes more and more theological as we go on, because <laughs> I think that the theology has more and more to offer, although it doesn't leave the secular behind either, because there are cultural evolutionary anthropologists who are really interested in the way um, religion changes and its impact on, on morality and, and um, moral sense. So, so I think that um, wisdom runs through also in, in two different dimensions. First, because I want to, the whole book to be thought of as holistically and it's impossible to put it all down at, in, in one book. Um, and secondly, because wisdom is always at root theological. So even though I'm talking about secular and uh, scientific, philosophical, evolutionary, anthropological, etc. work, it's also part of or integrated into what I understand by a wisdom narrative, which is what theology is trying to do. So it's another justification for doing this very broad basis for this research. It's not simply one topic or one, one subject, it's an integrated approach weaving through and taking us on a different kind of journey about what it means to be human. So to understand this integrative approach, we wanna focus on volume two, which just uh, came out, Shadow Sophia, but let's put it in context. So give me a short overview of volume one, which um, it, it deals with the concept of theological ethics through a multi-species lens, looking at um, our evolutionary history in in um, the mammalian and, and, and primate development, what we, can, what we can learn. So just a brief overview of the, um, of the conclusion and the approach of volume one. So we see the setting for volume two. Yes, well, thank you for that. Yes, well, what I was trying to do with volume, in volume one was to try and understand where tendencies that we might have for something like showing compassion or a sense of justice or wisdom, which is more of this integrated model where they might, may have come from. And because, I mean, I'm a, a biologist as well as a, a theologian. I don't think that 
human beings, Homo sapiens, were created de novo. I think we share an evolutionary history with, with other animals. And so, so I was trying to understand, well, what are the origins of some of these tendencies? Can we understand them from looking at the way animals behave? Can we understand them from looking at early human history? Can we understand them from talking to psychologists and the psychology of compassion or empathy? And so I, it was more about sort of knowledge and understanding, but it was also uh, uh, also about trying to, if you like, have a different kind of framing for our ethics. We've tended to think of our ethical approach as just being about decisions we make through our own reason, independent of these other creatures that have, if you like, been sharing our history. And the, one of the main arguments in this book is that we need to make a take a multi-species approach. That is, we haven't arrived the way we are alone. We have done it in co-evolutionary ways with these other creatures. So if we had, if we'd, we, if we'd been a single species on the planet, we wouldn't have become who we are at all. It was because of these close interrelationships with these other beings that we become who we are and being able to develop those aspects of, of justice, um, wisdom and compassion in the way that we have. For example, when early humans evolved, um, they became super cooperative. And the reason they did that was because they had to protect themselves from all the gi uh, giant predators and other things that were roaming the landscape. If we'd been completely isolated at that point, we wouldn't have cooperated in that way. And we wouldn't have shown the kind of, or developed the kind of compassion that we have. So. I'm saying that that context has shaped who we are and how we become moral beings. And it also has been shaped by the, the history that we share and some of those, if you like, um, tendencies that we also share with other animals, the inequity aversion, for example, that is the aversion to a sense of injustice that goes very, very deep back into our, into our um, evolutionary history. When we're comparing human beings with, um, uh, other primates, we have to be careful though, because the split between humans and, and chimpanzees, our closest living re relative, happened about six million years ago. So it's not like we've evolved from chimpanzees, but our common ancestor was like, like was likely to share some of the same characteristics. So it's, some of it is speculative because we can never get to that common ancestor, um, but we have to at least try. And so some of these research, the research that um, evolutionary anthropologists and others have done are in form or are very interesting to how we understand our own humanity. And even uh, psychological experiments with uh, primates uh, can show a sense of, uh, of fairness uh, where two monkeys, for example, uh, are given uh, food, but at different levels and one is, is and one the experiment for one is is clearly unfair in terms of the delivery and you can see a reaction in mm -hmm. in that monkey that that there's something unfair i mean it gets angry in in different ways so so you see little hints of what we would uh call some of these human moral uh, uh sensitive sensibilities yes yes precisely and that that of course is really interesting because there's a, a philosophical debate about what they really are feeling whether you can really get into the mind but you certainly see reactions and and someone called mark beckoff is particularly keen on on what he believes that we can anthropomorphize in other words we can as a heuristic tool imagine what it's like um i mean people with their own pets for example dogs can often sense that, that perhaps they, they feel things that seem analogous to humans. We don't know for sure, but certainly all the neurons and the neuro, neurological changes that happen in these animals are analogous to what happens in humans. So I don't think it's a, an unreasonable speculation to say that they're feeling something similar in many cases. And certainly their behavior um, shows, shows up in, in quite patterned and, and seemingly deliberate ways. Um, especially with the inequity aversion. Some people, some anthropologists um, and those studying primates don't like to use the word fairness and they prefer inequity aversion. It amounts to the same kind of thing um, in practice, but the reason that they're careful to use those terms is that the evidential basis for it uh, points more towards inequity aversion. Fairness could mean another deliberative step that they don't know whether that really sure. happened. That, that makes sense, of course. 
All right, let's focus on volume two, your new book, Shadow Sophia. And shadow reflects, I think, the darker side, as you've called it, of human nature, evil, and the propensity to sin from a theological point of view. And you argue that the shadow side reveals more clearly the meaning of virtues by identifying its associated vices, uh, that you can discern wisdom through consideration of what it is not. Um, how does that work? Because in a sense, evil uh, is the, the leap motif, the primary theme of your book. Uh, and so by focusing on evil, uh, how does this advance your argument? And what resources do you bring to the table to analyze evil? Yes, well, I mean, that's a very good question. And I have to say that when I started this book, I hadn't really expected to come to that conclusion, that actually it's illuminating for the virtues. Um, but there were two reasons why I did this. First of all, some of the classic uh, the, uh, early uh, Christian theologians claimed that actually understanding vices was really essential if we're really going to understand what virtue is, because if we don't understand why people are working in a way that's opposite to the virtue, we'll never really know what virtue has to confront or come up against. So it's not like it's saying that um, a vice is equivalent to a virtue. It's just that understanding the vice helps us to understand how to grow in virtues. Um, and then the second area is that many of the, of the vices such as greed, for example, in, the, in their moderation are actually necessary for survival. So we need a, if we, if we were completely self-effacing and decided we were never going to eat when we were hungry and all that kind of thing, we wouldn't survive. So, but when it, the interesting thing is, when does it start to change from being something that's valuable to the individual and the community to something that's harmful? Um, and that, I think that judgment about when it does that is also an exercise of prudence um, because it's not always possible to know immediately whether something is, is right or not. One of the most fascinating aspects of this book is that when I was writing it is the power of deception and the mm. way deception is used in the natural world, but also in the human community, um, it becomes lying and something much more deliberative. But there is also the possibility of self-deception where people are genuinely thinking that they are doing the right thing when actually it's, it's, the, it's the opposite. And so and I think we've got you know, examples in our own culture that sort of show that as well. So, uh, so I think that I think the, the, the point of this was to really understand, well, where does this evil come from? And there were two strands for that. One is, of course, the biological, that there are tendencies in other animals to act in, in ways that perhaps help to build up these tendencies in humans. Um, in other words, they form the frame from which these vices emerge, just as the, the, the preliminary tendencies for virtue then become full-blown virtues in, in human beings. So you have an analogous relationship here with vices. But, but also, um, as we think through what those vices are, it doesn't seem to be enough just to have a biological explanation. And this is where Paul Ricoeur was particularly helpful, because he talks about the fault and the, and the, the shock, if you like, of, the, of understanding that the fault. In other words, evil seems to go further than just these descriptions of, of tendencies to, to act wrongly. Um, there's something else that's broken in the human history um, which can't be so easily explained. And it's one, it's one reason why he gives some credit to Augustine, um, but he wants to change Augustine's message as well. Um, so, I, and I think that to an extent, I think Ricoeur is right. I don't think he quite knew what to do with the theology. He was writing more from a theological, from a philosophical point of view. But I think in as much as theology is illuminating for some of those um, undescribed or difficult to understand areas, not in terms of putting in a, a, um, the, the God of the gaps, but also, but, but rather giving a different kind of language, which helps us to understand better what maybe is going on. The use of deception uh, is fascinating. I'm going to uh, give a, uh, uh, an unembarrassed plug for Closer to Truth. Uh, we're going to focus on deception in Closer to Truth's 21st season, uh, 
which uh, will be premiered on PBS stations around the United States uh, within a few months. And then later this year will be on YouTube. In fact, we divide, we have two, two shows on it, one on deception in the, in the animal world, octop octopuses and various, various other um, uh, aquatic um, uh, animals, and then self-deception in the human world. Uh, because we, we believe, as you do, that deception is, a, is, is an important probe of understanding uh, what it is to be human, the sent our sentience and our consciousness. So that, that's, uh, that's coming. Where, where I'd like to, to have you be uh, very precise is that your approach to evil, I think, can be divided in, your, in the book into three big categories. The evolutionary anthropology of evil, the philosophy of evil, and the theology of evil. Um, philosophy seems to be taking a little bit of a secondary position to the evolution and theology, but just give me a sense of those three big um, ways of thinking as you approach evil in uh, Shadow Sophia. Yes, I mean, I was <clears throat> trying to, 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 to do all three and, and weave them together to, to a degree. So I think the, the biology of evil or the, um, that aspect both included psychology because not all the studies of evolutionary anthropology are sufficient to really come to firm conclusions about what, what's going on. And sometimes our own biases will read into those stories um, truths which aren't necessarily there. So in other words, we've been deceived ourselves in the way we've interpreted that early history. You know? And I'll give you an example of, of that. Um, originally, uh, it was thought that our early human ancestors were all incredibly violent. And so when some uh, bones were discovered that had some cut marks on them, it was assumed that they were um, cannibalistic um, people that were that did that. Uh, but later they found that those cut marks were came from hyena, hyenas, they, the teeth, you know, they matched it up to the teeth marks. Uh, and so th th there was a misreading, if you like, of that data because they assumed that our early human ancestors were these incredibly violent um, creatures that went around killing each other and other things. Um, and I, so I think there's been a, a shift in un understanding of that. But at the same time, we can't deny that there have that warfare, for example, is very distinctively human, and that warfare is also something that, that happened fairly early on in our history, and we're the only well, we're one of the few um, species that conducts collective forms of violence like warfare. Um, yeah. uh, there is another one too, um, wolves will, will do that where they uh, go after their own kind um, in a way that's analogous to humans. Um, but um, chimpanzees do to a degree, but not quite to the same extent. So that's, that's if you like, the the biological the cycle and, and the psychological um, aspects. The psychology, I used um, deception quite a lot. Uh, so I used the psychology of deception quite a lot in some of it. So psychology was woven in where appropriate. With the philosophical, I did rely quite a lot on Paul Ricoeur, as I've mentioned already, partly because his, um, he's written a, a whole outstanding series of, of books um, one where he we talked about the difference between mortality and our own um, uh, tendencies for, for ill, which he distinguishes um, in a helpful way, I think. So he was trying to understand where this evil comes from um, and what, by engaging with the, the, the theological, he came up with a kind of metaphysics of evil. And while he was doing that, one of the most striking things I noticed when reading his work was that he believed that evil actually allowed us to think more about the transcendent in a way that it wouldn't have happened if evil hadn't been there. So, so, so he, he, he wants to go beyond talking about evil as a mystery um, and talk about it more as a metaphysics um, or metaphysical aspect to what evil is. Um, and he uses the doctrine of the fall to do that but then he takes it on board in it in a different kind of way and I found that quite interesting because it again feeds into my argument that however awful evil might be maybe there are aspects of it which are more positive that is they point to something else that we wouldn't maybe have learnt if we hadn't experienced that kind of evil there's also 
um, an aspect too within the biological sciences that point to human beings being the most cruel species there are on the on the planet. Um, and that is a, a sobering thought. So sometimes we think of ourselves as as evolving morally over and above animals. And so, you know, we overcome our those passions which we associate with animals like anger and killing and so on. But actually it's it's not as simple as that. You know, our tendencies for cruelty are far more extreme than any, anything any other animal can do. And our, our ability to engage in mass killing of other people um, of our own kind is is uh, is not found as I, as I mentioned before in the in the animal kingdom. So we have to have or think through a kind of philosophy of what that looks like. And traditionally, people like um, Swinburne and others have talked about theodicy. That is, why is evil happened because of a sort of reasoned account? Perhaps it's come because of free will. And so, in order to have free will, there has to be freedom to do wrong as well as to do right. I didn't really discuss much of that in this book because I wanted to get to more um, a, a, a different kind of understanding, which actually to a degree rejects the adequacy of theodicy. Because I don't really think that the, the um, explanations through theodicy are really very convincing. Because what they seem to be doing is to, is to rationalize evil. And I, don't, I think there are, and that's why I like Paul Ricoeur, who's a continental philosopher, because what he seemed to be saying is that there's something irrational about evil that we cannot fully explain. And he tries to articulate that in terms of a narrative, a narrative around Jewish traditions, um, a narrative around some of Pauline anthropology um, and anthropology of sin, and also an, a narrative which includes Augustine's understanding of, of the fall. And I yeah. think that the fact that he is a philosopher is able to touch on those theological themes um, gives me pause to thought that he also seemed to understand that theodicy wasn't really enough. And he in fact said that himself, that he rejected the adequacy of the theodicy explanations, which are often the philosophical explanations that are used to interpret evil. And yeah. then the third aspect, which is theological, again, that is a development of Augustine, but also critiquing some of his work um, and I can say more about that if that's helpful. Yeah, we've, we've talked about that. Uh, theodicies have uh, no dearth of books uh, written about them, so uh, that there's, there's no problem that you haven't dealt with that in, in great detail. But you do bring a different view of how to approach that, uh, that problem. Uh, traditionally, when we're dealing with uh, evil, the discussions are uh, natural evil versus moral evil and how those work together. But by introducing uh, theology, uh, you've talked about a challenge at the intersection of how you have the evolution of immorality and theology is to distinguish not just natural evil and moral evil, but also to add in the concept of sin, obviously human sin, uh, into that mix and to situate, in essence, all three in the absolute presence of monstrous evil in the world. So how does the introduction of sin articulate with the traditional discussions of moral versus natural evil? Yes, well, and again, this is an enormous question. And I think that um, when we're thinking about sin, for me, sin is an articulation of a brokenness in our relationship with God, which is a fairly traditional way of understanding it. Um, so sin and evil, sin is more about agency, um, about human action in relation to God, whereas evil is broader. So I think what I was interested in was the, was the origin of evil as well as the origin of sin. Um, and so um, if you articulate it like that, then sin is a, is a theological term, whereas natural evil and, and moral evil are also trying to understand where evil have come from, but moral is normally tied into human actions and morality. And I'm trying to come to a broader understanding of what morality is. So it's more multi-species in our, in, in our approach. So we're not just thinking of ourselves in isolated terms as separated from the natural world, but those two are much more intermingled and intermixed. So I think that um, if you could say, if you said, can animals sin? Well, only in as far as they have a degree of volunt voluntarism. So, um, and also 
we don't really know how deliberate their acts are or if we define it in terms of their relationship with God, then it becomes much more difficult to say that <laughs> there is sin in other in other creatures. But there is the possibility of redemption um, in every, in all things. So that means that the the suffering and the and the brokenness that we find in the natural world through natural evil will certainly theologians hope will be taken up and and redeemed, which is another reason why. I have as an afterward, and I know you may come on to this at the end, um, a redeeming uh, sin, um, because I think that um, we need to, when we're thinking about some of these negative things, also see, you know, the next step uh, and give a hint, if you, if you will, is what, what will come or what will follow. You've critiqued the idea that our animal nature or animality is a primary source of the human propensity for sin, uh, because many of the things that animals do are the kinds of things that if a human would do would be sin. But you critique that idea that uh, the origin of sin can be, um, can be uh, assigned to the animal nature of our evolutionary history. Well, I think it's a little bit more complicated than that. What I, what I hope I try and do is to show how mixed animal natures are that they have a tendency for both good acts and less good acts. Um, and so therefore, in one sense, the origin of, our, of the, our ability to be moral is in the animal world. And so I critique the stereotype set that says we start off with our animality and then we bolt on our morality and that's how we become moral human mm -hmm. beings. I critique that and say, no, it's much more complicated. We start off with a mixed bag in the other animal world which has a tendency for good and less, less good. I'm not sure if I'd call it evil exactly. We could call it a tendency to, to evil. Um, and then similarly, human beings have the tendency to do both. Um, and so the, the origin of both our vices and our virtues do have a basis in the animal world, but the, our abilities to act in evil ways, in fully evil ways does depend on free will. And that's what's distinctive about human beings. So sin is only really possible for, for human beings in a fully articulated way. Um, and therefore, um, th therefore, I think we have to, to see where, you know, where those things are, are, are both not just their origin, but also how, it, how we become, com how our relationships have, have complexified the, these things, because we've co-evolved together and we also, the way we act now, for example, in some of the ways we treat other animals or treat the natural world around us sort of makes us lose track of where we've come from in terms of our entangled relationships with these other beings. The, the, the idea that carnivores, which are a large percentage of animals, of course, uh, have to kill other animals uh, in order to eat and survive and provide for their children as, as we eat other animals, uh, that can't be used as some uh, free cursor of morality or, or, or sin because, I mean, that's what they have, have to do to survive. Uh, how do you deal with that? Yes, I mean, I think that that's absolutely true. And um, when I talk about precursors for vice, it's, it's more the deliberative kind or the reason kind. So there, there have been some examples of of lions, for example, that, that kill, have killed their prey, not just not for their food, but seem to be doing it sort of indiscriminately um, without any real need for, uh, for, for, the, for the meal. And so when it starts to become that kind of behavior, it's edging towards the, um, something that is more difficult to understand just in terms of, of material needs. So you're absolutely right that that you know, in as far as animals kill to, to eat, that's a completely different kind of behavior than the kind of behavior that we're describing as vice, because it's part of their survival. So we have to distinguish between what animals are are, are doing um, and why they're doing it to uh, and compare that with 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 human beings. So so I think that the the tendencies for violence, for example, are built into the evolutionary history into an, into our animal world, but it's what, what are the reasons, what are the motivations behind that that are so important to understand 
in order to tell whether this is either a vice or evil in some way. So, so I think that you know many people would say that actually COVID nineteen even isn't you can't say that that's evil because it's just doing what it was made to do, just multiply itself. <laughs> so. Um, so it's it's perceived by us as a as a natural evil because of the damage it does to the human community. Sure. So sure. I think these things are quite complicated. Sure, and with animals it's the same thing. And again, it would be hard to distinguish between animals that that may uh, you know tease a prey or kill a prey when they are not hungry, um, because it's sort of the same instinctive behavior that that is uh, triggered. You have a pet dog and it listens to you all the time and is always obedient but if it sees a squirrel running across the lawn you know all bets are off it's going after that squirrel uh that's just an instinctive thing that's that's built in so i'd be a little chary about coming to some big philosophical conclusions uh, 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 uh in distinguishing kinds of animal behavior yeah, I mean, this is something that philosophers have debated on about whether we can really get into the mind of other animals or not, or whether there are some advanced primates who are very highly social animals. Some of their behavior with other animal kinds seem to, and certainly some of the work that Franz de Waal has done, seem to border on things which we would call um, corrupt or evil acts um, or even vices because they have very strong personalities. So they're not just instinctive. And one of the aspects of Franz Duval's work that really struck home to me was how not only is it possible for chimpanzees to act violently with one another, they are also able to control that violence in a deliberate kind of way as well, which was quite astonishing for me because I didn't realize that before, that there was this degree of self-control and deliberation that I hadn't anticipated would be there in in other animals. I thought it was much more automatic in the manner that you've just described. Um, mm -hmm. But I think it's important to see that there is the tendencies at least for this more deliberative or at least reasoned, or at least use of cogn co reasoned cogn cognition um, in uh, so many advanced social animals as well. We can't possibly tell without doing more research as to, as to how far that's analogous to humans or not, but certainly it's the beginnings of that tendency. You make the claim that uh, the co-development of religion and evolution uh, need to be thought through together. And indeed, religion can become um, a, a way to solve some evolutionary puzzles. For example, the tendencies for super cooperation in human societies and extreme form of altruism uh, that could uh, exist alongside interpreting evolution in, in purely biological terms. Uh, use the phrase, you know, if, if when religion develops, if, if God is watching, then no one will cheat on the group uh, and therefore build more uh, group coherence. So do you think that's a strong argument that in order to understand uh, human development, at least social evolution in, in the last you know, tens of thousands of years, uh, that the co-development of religion is an important factor? Yes, I mean, that is a it's, it's really interesting uh, proposal, of course. Some of that is, 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 speculative, is speculative, but it's also backed up by some evidence that, that people have used looking at different cultures, some of the cultural evolution of religion, it's more recent. Um, but I, one of the more interesting aspects that's emerged um, just in the last year or two is that some of that narrative about big gods being the punishing gods that you've just said may not be sufficient. There's also, it seems quite likely that um, there are ten that, that when gods are portrayed as as uh, as loving and compassionate and so on, that provides an incentive to act well. So it's not just a a, a fear based um, reaction in order to to account for the emergence of religion. There's also this sort of proactive basis for acting well because the especially when it comes to religious leaders that imitate it and there's a, a colleague of mine at the um, Arizona State University who's done some research on that and she's done some current psychology on it and she's compared prestige-based and dominance-based leadership and she's found actually that prestige-based leadership leads to much more um, proactive collaboration and cooperation than does the dominance-based leadership which, which seems to suggest at least that 
dominance models of either God or leaders or whatever don't always work out in the long run, even though they may have initial reactions that work in their favor. In the longer term, it's the prestige-based leaders that model good behavior that seem to create the most, um, uh, overall the most positive and cooperative behavior in the group longer term. What I'd like to do now is go through your book very rapidly because your chapters three, three through eight, which are the core of the book, are titled with um, uh, uh, um, uh, aspects of, of humanity that are, that are evil uh, or that are wrong. Uh, and so what I, I'm going to give you the title of each of those chapters, and I want you to give me one or two sentences to explain how your way of thinking uh, in terms of the evolution of, uh, of uh, wisdom, in terms of the philosophy and theology of evil can be applied to these categories. So real short for each one. First one, which is chapter three, selfishness and pride. Yeah, so um, the selfishness and pride came more from uh, Augustine, his understanding that selfishness and pride were the root, was the root of evil. So I used that as a sort of starting point. But then I also realized that Richard Dawkins had talked about the selfish gene um, and the fact that although he didn't necessarily mean selfishness in a moral sense, many of his interpreters did sort of understand it as having those kind of resonances. So it, I just sort of played with those two ideas of, you know, self, this interplay between self-interest, which again can be positive to a degree, but when does it become selfish in a way that's harmful to the community? And was Augustine right to say that selfishness and the pride is the root of all evil or not? Chapter four, violence and cruelty. Yeah, well, this again is the dynamic between violence that you might get in, in other, with other animals and what are its distinctive marks in, the, in, the human, in human societies. And I would say one of that is this ability to be cruel in a way that no other animals can, can be, that sort of deliberative tendency to, to hurt or, or injure another um, in, in a way that, that is rational, but at the same time, it's also irrational in a sense of it's where it's hardest, hard to understand where these things come from. And I was trying to, to work out what it was about this that led to Paul Ricoeur to say that this, you know, the, the evil has come into the world through this, this fault, you know, in the system, that there is something broken in our natural history or in our history that's led us to, to change from, from one into the other. Chapter five, anger and injustice. Yeah, again, th these are, are closely related because very often when we feel a sense of injustice, we also feel the emotion of anger. So I was trying to understand what the emotion of anger did in terms of our abilities to make good judgments or less good judgments about things. Um, and injustice, again, is connected with inequity aversion, but it's much stronger than that. And it also combines the individual and the community. So injustice is like the wisdom in that it's, it also deals with interrelationships, but it's to do with a, the framing of those interrelationships and how we understand those rationally um, and what rules we put in place in order to, to make sure that justice is, is reached and how do we define what that is? Um, how do we know what justice is? And does wisdom help us understand what justice is all about? Chapter six, greed, envy, and gluttony. Quite a combination there. I know, I was becoming, uh, it was becoming challenging towards the end of the book because I was writing too much and I don't think um, uh, the when anyone from the publishers here, but you know, they told me don't go over a certain word limit. So I started to have to combine things which maybe um, couldn't necessarily have been combined that well in one chapter, but I had a go in this one, um, partly because I think greed and gluttony are quite closely related in some ways, although gluttony is about self-harm, whereas uh, greed is often harmful to, uh, to other beings. And, you know, greed and gluttony are, are also, you know, part of this overall tendency to, to work, not for necessarily for ourselves, but against the the benefit of other beings, other people as well, mostly other people rather than other creatures. And so I was trying to understand, you know, what it was about them, where the harm came from, and what this 
what a wisdom approach might do in terms of setting that limit of, of what it what obviously um eating food or whatever to a degree is helpful obviously we have to eat enough to to be well but when does it become gluttony and so on so and i think they also um touched on some of our body images um that you know we have a different attitude now than maybe we did um early on in our human history about what is worthwhile and what isn't Chapter seven is one that I had a, a bit of a, 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 a contention with because you have a, a deception lying, which go together very well. We've talked about that before, um, but then you added lust to it. I thought lust should have had its own chapter. I mean, that's a, that, that doesn't, that, that seems to be quite distinct from uh, deception and lying. Yeah, I think you're right. And originally it was one <laughs> separate chapter. I shouldn't make excuses, should I? But I do, one of the things that I felt about lust is that, is that it was a form of deception very often. It was a self-deception because it was about not valuing the other person in the, in the right kind of way. So, so and also quite often um, self-deception was the basis before sort of lustful, lustful behavior happened, certainly as as theologians un understood it. At the same time, you know, how much is that squeamishness about what Augustine said and his hostility towards sex, et cetera. So I was trying to navigate all those things. So was Augustine being deceived or are we all being deceived about our own tendencies? So, um, and so I, I, I did put those together simply because there was having another chapter again would overextend this book. But in each of these, I felt not only could they become a whole chapter, they could have become a whole book each, but I had to try and limit myself and keep the, the broader sweep of wisdom. So wisdom was trying to knit these things together. And so in some cases, perhaps it was more successful than others. One could make an argument that uh, if, if there wasn't for lust, uh, we, we might not have very many babies in the world, but that's a whole yeah, other. I know, and that's another reason why there's this ambiguity about um, vice and, and, and virtue. So we need, we need a measure of lust, otherwise we won't exist. But at the same time, when does it become and uh, when does it become sinful? You know, so so that's again something else that I critiqued um, uh, Aquinas on, or even Augustine, because he seemed to have a very odd view of of human nature, not allow for any of that at all. Even we amongst those who are married couples. So it's again the sort of squeamishness within theology towards that area. It's quite characteristic of the church is often portrayed like that. Um, but I think we need to be much more honest about the positive aspects of that too. So. Right. And then the last chapter eight of these categories, despair, anxiety, and sloth. Yes, again, they don't necessarily go that well together either. I don't mind admitting that, but I had a go again at this chapter. Um, the, the anxiety was interesting because uh, some theologians, like Schleiermacher, or well, philosophers like Schleiermacher, for example, thought thinks that anxiety is the root of all evils. So he argues against Augustine, who thought that selfishness and pride is the root of all evil. Um, and I relate anxiety and despair together because they're very often thought of in psychological terms as having some analogies. And despair is often associated, and anxiety for that matter, with behaviours that are slothful or, or maybe just inability to act how far they really are slothful when they arise out of despair or anxiety is another question so it, then you have to have wisdom to discern when is the, when is this really something that you could call a vice or when is it coming from a mental health issue that that would be inappropriate perhaps to call it a, a vice it's more um, a side effect of of another um, tendency or weakness that needs to be to be dealt with or healed the afterword in your book is called Redeeming Sin. Now, why should we redeem sin? Uh, many people would think uh, that sin is part of the, the problem in, in uh, many facets of, uh, of, of human history uh, because people uh, accuse others of sin and that gives them justification for doing all sorts of, of really bad things. So uh, you want to redeem sin. Uh, why do you, how do you do that and why do you want to do it? Yeah, I think that by redeeming sin, I don't mean undoing a judgment that these things are sinful. What I mean by that is that, is there anything else that we can say about human beings other than that they have these tendencies for virtue and for vice? 
And I think that what I hope to do is to lead into the third volume, which is more about what we might call superlative tendencies from a religious sense to act even beyond what we may think of as being our natural capabilities for virtue and abilities to counter tendencies for vice. Um, so it's so that it's in that sense that I mean redeeming sin, not in the sense that we can take back that that history. Um, of course, eventually, if you believe in the eschaton, which many theologians do, then there will be a healing that goes on. But again, it's it's not about denial of the of the violence or the of the sin that's taken place. It's more about it being caught up and transformed in some way um, in a, in a different kind of future. So. So um, I hope that's sufficient to, to give a taste. I was trying to not to end on too negative a note. I mean, I didn't think I had been negative necessarily in dealing with these darker sides of our human nature. I did okay. find it hard to write, but what I wanted to do at the end was to open it up to something, again, leading on from those positive traits to thinking more about what, what redemption might look like. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with negativity. We want honesty and reality. Um, yeah, and sure. Yeah. all where they may. Now, I neglected chapter one, and I, I, I need to get back to that, because chapter one is, deals with the theological basis of sin uh, in certainly the mainstream uh, Christian religions uh, of original sin, the so-called fall of humanity, um, which uh, obviously Augustine had a, a major impact on, um, but in the modern world, uh, you know, that deals with the historicity of Adam and Eve and a whole bunch of other um, you know, contradictions to evolutionary history. Um, and I think, and I, I want to have your, your thought on this, that you uh, um, deal with this by distinguishing original sin, which is the traditional theological doctrine, versus the origin of sin, cleverly manipulating these words, uh, to mean something totally different. Uh, did I get that wrong? No, you didn't. I mean, but at the same time, I don't think they're completely split either. So I, I do want to distinguish them because I think that Augustine um, did talk about original sin, but it was more metaphysical or philosophical approach. So whereas the origin of sin is about, again, where do these tendencies come from? It's a slightly different take on, on why we've ended up being sinful. So his um, approach to it didn't really take into account at all the, the biological aspect other than assuming that animals were the source of our passions and our weaknesses, which is something that's been built so strongly into our culture that many people assume that today, even within amongst biologists and why Franz de Waal has critiqued that, critiqued that, he calls it the veneer theory, that we start off with these base elements and then we add on our morality. So. I think that Augustine has something to answer for, although the theological aspects have been stripped out. These other these other interpretations still rely on him indirectly, and it's um, and but also I wanted to, to discuss him because in the next chapter after that I talk about Paul Ricoeur and his interpretation of Augustine um, and why um, Paul Ricoeur's interpretation actually helps us to appreciate that Augustine's trying or grappling with the fault, as he calls it, or the fall, is doing something quite profound, even if we might not agree with all the details of the way he's worked it out. Um, so there are certainly aspects of Augustine's interpretation that I would profoundly disagree with, such as um, his assumption that unless infants were baptized, they would go to hell and all these kinds of things. So he takes the logic of his position to an extreme, um, but at the same time, I think it's worth thinking through theologically, you know, why it's important to understand this darker side of our human nature. And I suppose that's the, the thread that's, that's running through it, the wisdom, if you will, in here. But I've completely transformed Augustine's own understanding, including his, you know, very um, slightly odd negative attitudes towards sex, for example. I want to challenge that. Um, and because he tied sin into sex in a way that I think is is also in, inappropriate. Um, so, but at the same time, his understanding of, of sin as being this profound fault does, I think, still carry in some import, an important weight. Um, 
as you are now writing volume three, which will look uh, with a theological lens by focusing on distinctive elements of, of uh, human beings uh, to reach a, a transcendent by looking at some of the positive virtues. Uh, I, 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 I want to focus on just one aspect because it sort of links everything together where you talked about the, the impact potentially on understanding the techno futures that human beings are beginning to have, the transhumanism, which is a very hot topic, of course, in, in the world, and, and the potential theological ramifications of it. Just give us a hint of what that will be like. Yes, well, again, what I'm trying to do here, again, is answer that question. What difference does it really make to our morality to be religious or not. Um, and it's something that secular cultural anthropologists are interested in as well. And so I look at the infused virtues. And so I want to track virtues which are infused. By that it means sort of somehow directly inspired by God um, to do certain things like show charity, for example, that we might not be able to do otherwise. At the same time, I'm trying to get away from this split between nature and grace that sort of plagued the um, uh, the theological record uh, and recognize that there are uh, that we share something in common whether people are, are religious or not in terms of our ability to show virtue but that that is different that aspiration towards virtue is a very different kind of trajectory than the one from in transhumanism which is seems to be about overcoming our mortality and our weaknesses it, that is our physical weaknesses and, and not about becoming sort of better human beings or those who are able to, to act in ways which aspire towards um, goodness and the common good um, in the way that the virtue tradition has done. There have been some discussions around that um, with some of the transhumanists um, in, in terms of of, of manipulating our, our abilities to show morality and so on. Um, but many of them are um, don't really take sufficient account of the trials that many people believe you need to go through in order to become virtuous. So just to have a kind of psychological or pill that will help you be more compassionate, for example, isn't really the answer. So I think that, so, uh, so in addition to that, the transhumanists that not always, but often talk about uploading our brain into computer like chips or whatever. And that to me is disincarnate. So it's losing that rich understanding of our relationship with other animals, which I think is so important, both in terms of understanding who we are as human beings, but also even understanding why we have the religion that we do and, and how we can understand both ourselves and other beings in a much more holistic way. When volume three is about to be published, shoot us an email and we'll schedule another talk on, uh, on the future of, uh, of morality and, uh, and transhumanism. Uh, I, uh, uh, regarding uh, uploading into silicon or, or uh, disincarnating ourselves, I think that's only a small part of the problem. I think there are deep philosophical as well as scientific uh, objections to whether that's even in principle possible. That's another conversation. Great talk to you, Celia. It's great seeing you. Uh, keep working on volume three and let us know when it's going to be published. Yes, thank you so much. It's, it's going to take a while because it may be tied into another grant project that I'm working on at the moment, which means it will be delayed a bit. But, um, but no, it's been, it's been very pleasant talking to you and enjoyable. And I hope this recording will, um, will get a good airing. So thank you. I hope you enjoyed watching. To see more conversations, subscribe to Closer to Truth's YouTube channel.